But I found out that the FBI is not one entity. I got calls from the FBI somewhere in um, Santa Fe that there was a report of a dark-haired man with two drivers stopping at a 7-Eleven. I said, yeah, that was me. All right, it's Monday at 11 o'clock, folks. You know what that means. It's the Chaz Palminteri Podcast. But before I bring on my legendary guest, before I do that, you know the drill, a little some house cleaning to do, and that is if you want to come and see my one-man show, if you never saw it, you got to see it. This is the show that was before the movie, before the musical. This is the show that started it all. Go to chazpalmentary.net, and I will be at a city near you. John, where am I? So April 13th, you're going to be in Clarksburg, Virginia, at the Robinson Graham Performing Arts Center. April 20th, you're going to be in Atlantic City at Ocean Resorts Casino. Atlantic City and Ocean Resorts. Be there. May 18th, you're going to be in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, at the American Music Theater. And May 31st, you're going to be in Ridgefield, Connecticut, at the Ridgefield Playhouse. Ridgefield Playhouse, May 31st. So you got to come down and see it. And don't forget, folks, don't forget my merchandise on chazpalmentary.net. Come visit my restaurants, Chaz Palmentary's at 30 West 46th Street, and Chaz Palmentary's at 264 Main Street. The big rage is the pepperoni, the honey pepperoni pizza. All right, now we're going to get to my guest here. I'm, you know, I'm a little, you know, I'll have a lot of big guests on here, but this guy, when I see him, he's a... To me, he's an icon. He really is. People throw that word around, icon. icon. He is an icon. Okay. Uh, this Friday, we just gave him, I, he, he chose me to give him the Medal of Honor. Now, the Medal of Honor in menswear design, folks. Nobody gets the Medal of Honor for menswear design. This is the first time that was ever given. The first time. And they chose this man. He started out many years ago. Uh, I think he worked for Ralph Lauren, if I'm not mistaken. But he's up there with Valentino, Armani, Versace, Ralph Lauren. So many great designers. He's my favorite men's designer. Uh, in fact, I'm wearing his uh, black turtleneck right now. He told me once, he said, hey, whenever you got nothing to wear, just put on a black turtleneck and a nice pair of jeans. You'll look great. So I never forgot that. So remember that, folks. When you want to look great, get a Joseph Abood black turtleneck, nice pair of slacks, and you look great. So I, I gave it away, but here he is, the one, the only, Joseph Abood. Chess, what an honor to do this. I'm so excited that, Listen, that you thought of me. Thought of you? Friday night. <laughs> What a great Friday night. night yeah. I gave you the Medal of Honor. Yeah, you know, uh, the National Arts Club has a 125-year history. Okay. They've given it to Salvatore Dali, Tennessee Williams. And now guess who finds himself in the mix is Joseph Abood. Well, but the that's first great. the first menswear designer to ever receive it. So of all the awards, and it's great to get the accolades, this one's really special because it's artistic. Right, right. I mean, when they told you you were getting the Medal of Honor, how did you feel about that, Joseph? You know, it was sort of a very personal feeling like okay, I've got my work and my designs and my clothes and the men's wear industry and women's wear industry. But because it was an artistic award, it was a different thing for me. It really felt right. like, wow, this is pretty special. It was more personal, more personal. Right, well, when you talk about artistic, Tennessee Williams, Salvatore Dali. <laughs> and you know, well, how does my name fit no, into that? No, <laughs> no, and everybody always does that. When they, get, when they get an award, they go, how did I get it? No, you know, it's... Don't be humble. You got it because you are, to me, in my Thank opinion, you. You, the greatest Jesus. menswear designer in the Thank world. And that's just not me. Many other people said that. Yeah, thank you. But I want to go, I want to go like, here you are getting the Medal of Honor. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the beginning. Okay. Okay? Uh, you grew up in Boston. That's right. I know that. I mean, I, we, we <laughs> we've fight. had our moments. We got our moments. We fight over that. <laughs> yeah. But wait, did you always want to be a designer? You know, the irony, Chaz, was that I have a teaching degree in English and French comparative literature. So I was lucky enough in my junior year of college to get a scholarship to go study in Paris. 
So whenever, uh, whenever people say, oh, you studied in Paris, you know, it's about draping and fabric design. It wasn't, it was all about literature. But what did happen was, this is, I'll give you the dates, 1970, 71. I saw a world that was so different than the Boston I knew. And the, one of the great stories was, I was on the Metro subway. And I used to take the T in Boston. You know, it's working class. Right. You know? the, the Metro, the train stops, and the door opens up, and a man in a tuxedo and a woman in a gown, it was at the opera Metro station, and they walk into the subway. And I said to myself, I don't know what world this is, but this is a world I want to live in. And it was such a stark contrast to what I had grown up in in Boston. And so I think living in Paris for that year, and I saw men dressing beautifully and the cafe society, people on the streets and women with scarves. And there was such a style. Now, this is a long time ago. Yes. I said, this is a world mm -hmm. I want. This is the world I want to live in. You wanted to be in that world. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But I didn't <clears throat> think of myself as being a designer. Uh, this is amazing to me how this happens. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, so, you know, I come back, I, I graduate from college, I get offered a teaching job at Brookline High School, which was a very good school system up in Boston. Right. But then I was offered a management position in a, a great men's store called Louis of Boston. It was a great store. You would have loved it. It's no longer existing. Mm -hmm. But I was able to get <clears throat> a management job and I was able to start to travel to Europe because I actually spoke French because I had lived in France. So my boss loved the fact that I could translate, do a lot of things. So at the ripe age of 22, I was traveling to Europe on buying trips. 22 years old. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and so I stayed at that job um, for about eight years. I, I did it four, four years part-time, eight years. And then in 1980, um, I knew that I had to be out. I, I knew I couldn't stay in Boston. Right. And I was fortunate enough to be offered a job at uh, Ralph Lauren, Polo Ralph Lauren. And um, that was such a great, you know, five-year experience working for Ralph directly. He's, a, he's an incredible talent. Yes. And it's really the father of American menswear, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you that he's, you know, obviously he's a neighbor. He's, a, very... he's a neighbor, but, but clearly, you know, his first collection was 1967. Was it that early? 67? Yeah, 67 was his wow. very first collection. As a matter of fact, you'll appreciate this. I just noticed that he's got Aaron Judge, one of your favorites, Yes. Um, representing Polo 67, his new fragrance. So I, I, it's not that I want to promote it, but, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, sure, yeah, Ralph's no. a big Yankee fan. And, and, uh, yes. and you know, so Me it's and Ralph cool. are together with yeah. that. Yeah. And you're the big one. I'm the black sheep. You're, no, well, you're Boston. That's <laughs> yeah. all right. Yeah. So go on, go ahead. So, so you worked for Ralph. So I worked for Ralph, and I had a wonderful, really five years with him, and worked directly with him, and the business was doubling every year. But I realized, after I had suggested some design ideas, that they really weren't right for Ralph Lauren. Right. Because they were a little bit more forward, a little bit more advanced. And Ralph is, is the king of tradition, you know, tweed jackets right. and... And so I realized that I might have something different to say to the industry. And I, I, my goal was to make men feel like men, not like boys. I wanted them to dress in the character of Hollywood. I had all of the European experience. I wanted American men to be on an equal par with men around the world. Right. And that's when I launched what I called an American International Collection in 1987, was my first collection, 20 years after Ralph had launched his collection. And wow. I remember the night before opening the collection, I said, am I, am I a jerk? I had the greatest job with the greatest designer in the world. And now I'm going to, and who's going to want another collection? Who really needs me? You know, it's that stage fright. I <laughs> yeah. don't know as actors if. Oh, yeah, if actors say, get that all the time. You know, and we opened to raves and we sold every major store, Barney's, Saks, Neiman Marcus. We actually got our first season, a shop at Bergdorf Goodman in New York, when Bergdorf Goodman was only a woman's store. So we had a men's shop on the first floor of Bergdorf Goodman for my very first collection. And that was the beginning of the Joseph Abood world. And how old were you? At that time, I was 37. Wow. Yeah. What a, that was huge, man. It was, yeah, it was huge because I didn't realize that it hit a nerve in menswear. Right. That men were 
craving something more sophisticated, something a little more interesting. So I always thought my collection was drop dead in the middle of the Atlantic. I could make American men reach more. And I also appealed to the European market where they liked the style of America. So I always thought my collection was born right in the middle of the Atlantic. So that's why both coasts loved it. Both coasts. And and we did a lot. We had a lot of shops throughout Europe and we had European partners and sold our ties throughout uh, uh, Europe and Asia. So we made a we 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 made a really important impression very quickly. Wow! And so once you now, but now here's the thing. Now, okay, big success your first collection, right? But they always say now you got the pressure on you. Right now you're not this like young up no, and coming. That's right. Right. Oh my God! What do I do now? So. Right. Right. What, what did you decide well, to do? The, it's sort of that old sophomore thing. Well, you know, you're, you know, you've, 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 you've made your launch. You're doing a great job. So for the first two or three years, we, we, I, we, we won a lot of accolades. The Menswear Designer of the Year from the fashion industry two years in a row. Right. Which again, it's such an honor to have that. And so constantly, I, I was doing new things. For example, I ended up designing cars for G- General Motors. We did a Joseph Abood. Uh, Regal for General Motors sold five thousand cars. It was it was so great. And then I'd gotten into the home. I loved working in the home world and had women's wear for about ten years. But ten years. But my true love is men's wear. Is men's wear. Yeah. yeah. Because I'm still stuck in the Hollywood thing. I'm still stuck with Cary Grant and Gary Cooper. I love these guys. Tyrone Power. Tyrone Power. You know, David they, Niven. Uh, you know, I and yeah. and the clothes that they wore. My my favorite scene in one of the movies is, is Rebecca. Uh, when Laurence Olivier, you first see him in this movie, mm. and he walks in, and he's got a black peak lapel tuxedo on. And I go, if I could only get American men to look like that. So that, oh. that's been my inspiration over the era. Uh, certainly, Hollywood has been a huge influence on on my clothes because I really love the romance of it all too. The artistry, the romance, and it's, it's sexy. You know, a guy looking beautiful in his clothes, he can be fully dressed and he's pretty sexy. Now, when is the point? <laughs> I, because, you know, uh, styles change. And yeah, of things. course. But the, the thing that I can't get over is, you know, fads change, but mm-hmm. your style is always in, you know, there's a, there's a theory about that where, you never want to design in extremes, meaning if clothes are tight and trim, you don't yeah. want to be the skinniest. <clears throat> and if clothes and shoulders, if if you may remember in the 90s, a company like Hugo Boss, which is a great company, yeah. their shoulders used to get bigger and bigger. And I would make a joke saying if the shoulders got any bigger on their clothes, you'd have to turn sideways to come through the doorway. <laughs> you know, so yeah. I've never, I've always loved to live in an intelligent style for men, not too extreme. Think of things like if someone had bought something from me 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that there was a life to that product, that I designed it far enough in the future that it wasn't like it was out next season. It wasn't like, oh, you, that's, oh that's so last year, that's a last year's. Right. I always tried to design with the future in mind, like a black cashmere turtle like, like you're wearing, and thank you. 20 years from now, that tur- that turtleneck is perfect. It's still, yeah. It's classic, yeah. but it it's not just because sometimes classic has the connotation of being boring. True. But classic is really handsome and really stylish. But there's a reason why they say it's a classic. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean say that about cars. Say that about movies. Say it about people. Yeah. 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 A yeah. classic is something that, Stands the test of time, it doesn't it? Stands the test of time. Yeah, I mean that's how you judge a classic. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of movies that when they first came out, they got slaughtered. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, they didn't make a box office. Yeah, and it was really—I I tell you—it was Robert De Niro who taught, uh, who actually taught me, and said, "You can't judge a movie when it's in its time. Is it going twenty-five years from now? Look mm-hmm. at the movie, right, and see how it aged, and that'll tell you if it's a classic or not." Uh, the Godfather. Yeah, you know I could watch that. It's on every night, and I could yeah, watch it. I could watch every. Why is that? It's a classic. A Bronx Tale. Well, I, 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 I not, not. I have to tell you something about this. Yeah. Because 
not only is it an incredible story and an incredible film, is the style of that film. Yeah. There's, I don't know if people look at that beyond what an incredible film, but mm-hmm. I don't know if they analyze it. You know, I look at it and say, it's so artistic in the way this was done. It's gritty and it's tough, but it's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, that's, that was really Bob De Niro who... Well, it really, was brilliant. You know, he took my script and he just you know elevated it yeah. and made it shine. Yeah. You know, that's, I've, I've been saying that for 30 years. Yeah, but that's, the yeah. Kind, that's a classic. Yeah. That film... It's it's going in the archives because yeah. you can and you can watch it and it never feels dated. It it's so of the moment, even right. though it was shot a number of years ago. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, you're right. But when you design something, mm-hmm. did you ever design something and you regretted it? So that was my safety valve. I always would say. Whatever, let me look at my designs. Forget about whether I'm getting accolades or getting a good article. Right. I would look at it as, what is that going to be like five years from now, four years from now? Am I going to want to see somebody wearing that? And, and let me tell you, the best award you can ever win. I, I could be on Madison Avenue or Fifth Avenue or anywhere, and I see somebody walking down the street, and they, let's say they're wearing one of my jackets or one of my sweaters. Yeah. It's the greatest award you can ever win. It is the best thing. Yeah. So I've, I've always, yeah, am, am I perfect? By no means. Uh, but I've always tried to respect my customers, respect right. my audience. Forget about what the press wants. What do I think I'm doing right? Because I, I don't want to design for the press. You design for yourself. I design for myself, but I also want to, I think there's a lot of me's out there who want yeah, style. That's, it's very similar to the film business. Now, in the film business, they make a film. Mm-hmm. And the studios, they want you to do this. You have to have, um, they do these focus groups that people oh, yeah. have to look at it and make notes. When you design, I'm, I'm yeah. curious, to say, when you design, yeah. do you ever have to like go to these focus groups and say, well, how, you know, how do you people like it? Do you ever have to do that? When you do that, it's over. It's over. Because it's like, that's how we got a camel. I mean, it's basically... Uh, 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 all parts that don't seem to work together. I've never believed in focus groups because they have a life of their own. Right. Meaning one guy might have the nerve to stand up and say, no, I think the colors are too bright. Then you have 12 other people who go, yeah, I think he's right. The, the colors. Are- True. I, I think it's important to know if you can know your work and judge your work and know your place in the universe. For example, I think I know what's well done in terms of design. Once people start to tinker with it, I don't know what you end up with. Then you lose your own yes. your own compass. Like, I agree. You know, uh, there was a story where um, one of my executives, and you know, you, you have the sort of left brain, right brain world of, in, in the fashion business too. Well, let's, let's see what people want to buy from us. So he basically, I don't do a lot of red ties. So someone in the audience says... Uh, or in the focus group, let's, I think you could do more red ties. So the CEO comes back very humbly and says to me, you know, we should have more red ties in our collection. I said, you know, Bob, I don't do red ties. So there aren't going to be any more red ties. If they don't want to buy my ties the way they are, then what are they buying? Uh, It's a little bit like the story I mentioned to you about Ralph Lauren when he first sold his first necktie collection. And uh, the buyer said, we'll buy your collection if you make your ties narrower. And Ralph was the king of the wide tie. And Ralph had the courage and the nerve and probably not a lot of money. And he said, you don't buy my ties the way they are, then I'm not going to sell you. And he probably needed to sell them. So, you know, knowing your place in the universe and knowing what you're good at is yeah. really important. And I know what I'm not good at, but I, there are certain things that I know that I trust my instincts. Right. Now, do other people ever give you ideas and you go, I think that's a great idea, and use that idea? The danger of that idea is if this, all of a sudden you're plagiarizing somebody else's collection. So my inspiration is never really somebody else's collection. If I go to Tokyo and I start to see the colors of their garden, that's my next collection. It isn't clothes or fabric. I see. I just came back from Scotland. I can't get enough tweed. I can't get enough. Yeah, right, right, I can't right. get enough tartan. You know, you have to be good enough to let it come to you. Right. I would assume it's 
any creative world is that way. Whether you're an actor or an yeah. artist, is you got to let it come to you. Yeah, it's a little different in filmmaking. You know, other people, an actor. Yeah, uh, no, I understand. The first director can come up with a great idea. You go, hey, that's great. You know, it's always like the head. I always felt the CEO of any company, his uh, brilliance comes in hearing everybody and yes. taking a good idea yes, yes. and using that a good right. idea. But let, let me give you the flip side of that. I always, I, I think I prided myself on having great design teams, young designers. After I started doing it all and we right. started getting bigger and you mm -hmm. hired design assistants. But I never picked people based on pure creativity alone. I really based it on their, their intellectual thought process of how they got there. So even if a designer came in and showed me their portfolio to, so I would hire them, right. if it wasn't in my style, a lot of designers would say, well, that's not my style, I'm not gonna hire them. But I always wanted to know, how'd you get there? Like, what's your thought process about that? Because I, I thought if they would work with me and get to know me and they were smart and they had this intellect, that they would bring things. And I was always open to ideas yes. from my younger designers. Wow. I loved, I, loved, I loved having that interaction because they aren't cursed with too much knowledge. Sometimes with the experience. Oh, I agree. Sometimes it's a, it's, you have to mm. trust your instincts again and say, now, why did you think we should do triple-breasted suits? I mean, you know, why do you yeah. think we should? I always want to know what they think. And then I might say, well, it doesn't seem to work, but tell me maybe we could make it work a different way. Yeah. So I love the interaction with my creative teams. Sometimes it's, there's nothing like hunger. To meet a young designer or a young filmmaker or a young... Right, right. When they just want to... They come in with all kinds of ideas yeah, yeah. and... And it's just harnessing that energy. And it's harnessing that energy, right, right. Right, right, Well, sometimes you hire the old pro if you want somebody for props and you of hire course. a guy who's been of course. 50 movies. And, and that's he great, too. He just walks in and goes, you know, my work speaks for yeah, itself. Yeah. There's something to be said for that. Sometimes I just like a young guy who's... Young just, filmmakers. I mean... They're, you know, are they the uh, next, you know, uh, Martin Scorsese? You don't know. You they don't could, know. And so it's wonderful to give them the chance to, you know, show their stuff. But they are, they're blessed with creativity, but they don't have the life experience sometimes. Right. And so I think that's where we can mentor a little bit more and say, okay, yeah, maybe just show them where the potholes are a little bit and show yeah. them where the, where the liabilities are. You know, you and I have been friends for a long time. We're neighbors, yeah. of course. And um, we always talk about life and about things. And, and I want you to just tell that story, if you mind, about when you went to Boston uh, and you were coming back. And would you just tell that story with, with the plane you were going to be on? Oh, in terms of 9-11. Uh, 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 right. Yeah. So um, I was on um, September 10th. Right. It was a miserable night. And the Yankees and the Red Sox were playing at Yankee Stadium. Right. I don't know if you remember that. So I had to go out to do Nordstrom's and Saks and do a number of personal appearances. Right. So uh, we have a flight on September 10th. And we literally, the flight was supposed to take off at 5.30. We didn't take off till 11.30. So we were on the plane on the runway for six hours, which, huh? is, which is not allowed anymore, by the right. way. Right, they don't You're do not allowed that. to yeah. do that. Right. So I said to my assistant in the PR, I said, we've got to get off this plane. We'll take a plane tomorrow morning because, you know, I'm going to get in at, what, 4 o'clock in the morning? I mean, it's, it's a 50-minute plane ride. You know? No, but I was flying to L.A. Oh, you're flying to I'm L.A. Flying, okay, I'm flying sorry. to L.A. Okay. Yeah. So I figured, you know, we're going to, we have a three-hour time difference. We're going to, you know, it's crazy. We're going to, we'll just move our personal right. appearances up. They wouldn't let us off the plane. So we end up flying out, and it wasn't a very full plane. So the next morning, it's 6 o'clock in L.A., 9 o'clock here in New York. And I'm on the phone with my wife. I'm saying, you know, and she's got CNN on. And she said, you know, a, a plane hit the World Trade Center. I said, oh, my God. So I put it on. And as we're talking, we said, the second plane hit. And now we know there's a terrorist attack. Right, sure. I'm on the West Coast. She's on the East Coast. My kids were 10 and 7, my daughters at the time. Right. They were, you know, as everything was happening, they were panicked. No one could reach each other with cell phones. Yeah, I know. I was on the and West they, Coast, too. Yeah. They knew I was flying out, and they were they thought that their mother wasn't going to tell them that I was on one wow. of the planes. So wow. here I'm on. I, I said, I'm probably a lot like you. I don't give it. I don't, I don't give a rat's ass. Sorry. I'm getting home. 
And so there was no plane. Right. There were no trains. So there's a good chance you would have been on that morning flight. Well, I'll tell you the rest of the story. So I end up, I get a limousine and I call a limousine company. I said, how much would it cost to take a limo <laughs> from LA to Bedford, New York? Nonstop. Nonstop. The guy said, I never did that before. I'll call you back. Calls me back. He said, $11,500. If he told me $111,000, and it, it I, wouldn't I, have mattered. I was going. Yeah. I said, okay. He said, we'll give you two drivers, and they'll drive nonstop. So from L.A. to Bedford, 53 and a half hours straight. I slept. We stopped at McDonald's. We did, they drove. They said, we'll get home because I wanted to be with my family. But what happened was, because I had a round-trip ticket, and I never took the flight back, the FBI got in touch with me. Oh. So the FBI, now my name is Middle Eastern, but I, you know, I can't be any more American. I grew up in Boston. I'm a Red Sox fan. Right. I mean, I can't be any more American. But, and they were really, really great, these guys. They said, um, could, we, uh, could we come to your house and talk to you? And my kids were little and I was worried. I said, well, could you come to my office? So they came to my office in Manhattan and they said, well, not only do we know that, you know, you didn't come back and we know who you are, I said, but we want to show you some pictures of hijackers that could have been on your plane. He said, we found box cutters and we found remote controls on the plane that you were on. And I thought to myself, if the weather had been good and that plane took off at 530, that that plane could have hit the World wow. Trade Center. And the FBI, I, I have to give them kudos because they were working, as you probably remember, 24 hours yeah. a day trying to track down leads. So I had three or four encounters with the FBI, all, all very positive. But I found out that the FBI is not one entity. I got calls from the FBI somewhere in um, Santa Fe that there was a report of a dark-haired man with two drivers stopping at a 7-Eleven. I said, yeah, that was me. We were, we were driving back. Yeah. So there were a number of incidents like that. But um, yeah, it was really scary. But the, the follow-up to that too is my office was right on Fifth Avenue. And so for months after that, I'd be looking at a swatch, you know, blue, green, red. And then I'd hear bagpipes. And I looked out my oh. window. And every day, every I, could, day. I was sort of a, uh, I, shouldn't, I was like a peeping Tom. I was watching funerals fire trucks filled with flowers and then you'd see a black limousine you see a woman come out with two little kids yeah so for months in my office which was literally looking down at saint patrick's i could see that so i, I you know and i'd say I'm, I'm looking at a swatch how relevant is this and it was a tough time for all of us in new york and, yeah no um, it, was, it was a tough time yeah. but hey you know you go to you know it, it's like you walk in one door, you walk in the left door, you, you could be gone. I think of that all the time. I think of that all the well, time. Well, I think about the movie, and we were talking about <clears throat> yeah. stepping in the car yeah. and not stepping in the car. Yeah. And the reality, the real fact is that you almost stepped in the car. Almost. Yeah. And all of the great things, including your beautiful family, would never be here. Would never be here. I would have been there gone. No I, great I would have been gone at yeah. 18 years old, yeah. 17, 18. Yeah. So none of this. I know, and this is... You know, this is a great testimony to kind of an incredible career. You know, yeah. I don't say that as if I were interviewing you because that's how I feel about what you've, what you've done artistically. Well, thank you. I try to tell people that your life is not just your life. Your life is a universe. Yeah. It's when you, A person who's born is creating a universe yeah. that you will have a wife, you will have children, they'll have children, right. they'll do things. It's, it's just not you. It's, yeah. Well, it's like we were talking about It's a Wonderful Life, the movie yeah. with Jimmy Stewart, where yes. all of the people he saved and all of, right. it. Right. It's really true, but the same thing with you. So. Yeah. Now, I got a, I saw this photo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, you know, Humphrey Bogart's my, my God. Right. It was your Robinson, Humphrey Bogart. So here are you with uh, Laura McCall and, and Peter Allen. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty close to, to Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> There's this. Yeah. That's uh, you remember yeah. anything about that? I, I do, I do. I was um, I was starstruck because, as you loved Humphrey Bogart, I could watch Casablanca oh. for the clothes 
right every day of my life and just right. try to and the thing about that is i always wondered what color those clothes were I, it's like a quest i'm on that's right because it was uh, black, black and, and white. white right oh, but God. meeting she couldn't have been more gracious and i thought yeah this is as close to humphrey bogart as i'm ever gonna get wow but it's those moments that um it was um it was the first award i won which was uh you have to pinch yourself sometimes and when you're with people like that <laughs> yeah, I, I know do. i do <laughs> I still do. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I am still starstruck. And I, I, I think with Hollywood, especially in film and, you know. Right. You know, you, you call Robert De Niro Bob, you know, I, and he's a friend. You know, it's, it's just a different, you know, I, I'm yeah. still in awe of that. I, I really am. And the talent that is to make great films. There's a lot of films out there. Oh, yeah. But then there's not that many amazingly great films. Now, here's another shot I, ha- I got to show you because <laughs> yeah. I think this is... Here, here is Wynton Marsalis. Yeah. Now, I know you dressed him in his band, right? Yeah, yeah. Lincoln Center Jazz. In Lincoln Center Jazz. Now, they're all in white. Yeah. Not only are they all in white, they're in white linen. White linen. Oh, yeah. Like, there's nothing more beautiful than a, than a white linen shirt or a white linen jacket. But uh, uh, when wow. I was talking to him, I said... You know, most of the most most of the time, the Lincoln Center Jazz and the bands right. would wear dark, you know, tuxedos. I said, "Step it out, do it all white." And it was in the summer, so you would do that, right? It was in the all summer. White. And um, he was, he said, "Whatever you want to do, Joe." So he actually played at one of my events, right? And I was worried about people talking while he was just up there with his band. And he said, "You know what? Let everybody have a good time. That's what jazz is about. Jazz is about." people interacting the music behind right, him. Right. What an artist he is. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, what, what an greatest. artist. So, yeah. But to be able to dress guys like you or, to, or, or even Brian Gumbel, who was incredibly stylish and still is, uh, to do NBC Sports and CBS Sports for the Olympics, doing all of that when no one was doing that was really a substantiation of, you know, they like my work. Right. And, you know, it's always that, maybe it's that little boy that you talk about or that yeah. kid that says, is this really? Is this really happening? Because you know, you know, it's funny you say that because people could say they like your work, but when they wear your clothes, that means they like Can your I work. You, that's what I mean about seeing something you designed, like walking yes. toward you, and you go, "I want to." I actually want to stop them and say thank you. Which, thank you. <laughs> you know, it's funny you said that because uh, Bert Backrack. Oh, one yeah. time, somebody asked him, "What is the biggest thrill, or greatest award, or whatever?" Yeah, and he said the weirdest thing. He said, "I was walking down the street." And somebody walked by me with his wife whistling my song. <laughs> How great is that? Whistling one of his songs. How great is that? Yeah. He says he just yeah. was like, wow. That kind of talent, you know, really somehow is infectious. It, it gets to people. Right. Oh. Now, you have two daughters. Yeah. And their names are? Lila. Which Lila. She was named after my mom. And, and when she was a little girl, she didn't love her name. And now she loves her. She name. loves her. What's oh, a great name? It's a, you know, but it, and Ari is my my younger daughter. She's uh, she's going to have my first grandchild. Your first grandchild. Yeah, you know? wow. and it's going to be a little boy because I grew up with nothing but women. So we finally get someone. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> your be, lovely wife. Yeah, Lynn. And then I grew up with three sisters, older sisters. It was like having four mothers. That was exhausting. And you had all these women, but you designed for men. Yeah, yeah. Now yeah. here's you. Now, this has to be a thrill when you see this photo. This is with yeah. Lily, right? That's Lila. Yeah. Lila, excuse me. Yeah, Lila. Lila. So she was one. This is 1992. Yeah. And someone said to me, why don't you think about like having your family in the audience? I said, oh, of course they'll be there. They're little. I didn't have my other daughter. I said my right. wife. And I said, guess what? I'm taking her out on the runway. Sure. And so she got more cheers than I did. Um, but it's, it's a memory, you know, it's, and, and she sees that picture right? and she's now a young woman, you know, and having her own home. And it sort of reminds us of who we are and how right. important family how is. How do they feel about my father's Joseph? <laughs> You're really just dad. Yeah, I'm dad. You're the dad. perfect story on that one is, so one day Lila must've been 12. Right. And I had a board meeting, like a big financial board meeting. I come down in this chalk striped flannel suit. <laughs> White shirt, silver tie, pocket square, and I'm looking at them. And so, kiddingly, I say, Lila, how do I look? She goes, Daddy, you look handsome. But she said, are you going to wear that tie? And I said to her, Lila, do you know who I am? I'm Joseph Abood. I go and I look in the mirror, 
I said, I think she's right. I changed my tie. That's the power of women and my daughter. I, so, you know, I am just dad. You're just dad. I'm just dad. The other story with Ari, the little one. Yeah. We are at the cleaners in Bedford. Yeah. And she used to like to go. I, I promised her I'd buy her a Barbie or something. I said, right. I have to first stop at the cleaners. Yeah. So I take my clothes in to the cleaners. And I'm waiting. And she said, Daddy, can we go? Can we go? And I said, honey, I have to wait and get my ticket. And she said, what do you need a name on your ticket? Your name's in your clothes. So she thought that everybody that, like, when Chaz Palminteri yeah. takes his jacket, well, although if this is the case now, yeah. takes his jacket, there's a Chaz Palminteri label in it. Or if John Smith goes yes. into the... And that's why you're always just dad. Like, just she didn't... Dad. Yeah. Uh, My son once... I heard him... I was leaving, and the limo came to pick me up. <laughs> yeah, I was going yeah. away to do a movie. And I heard my son talking to one, and he was about eight, maybe eight or nine, and he was talking to some of his friends. And they said, hey, Dante, where's your dad going? Because they saw the car outside. And I come down, he goes, ah, my dad, he's got to go be Chance Palminteri. And I thought that was so weird. Like, <laughs> but, but, but that's because what he was saying is your dad. Doesn't matter all that other stuff. I don't know stuff. who Chance Palminteri is, but that's my dad. <laughs> so it was like really strange yeah. to me when he said that. You yeah. know, I go, but don't you, you think that's about? grounding, though? Is it a kind of yeah, great... Yeah, well, he's very grounded. Well, he's a, yeah. he's a handsome kid. Yeah, my, he's so a great kid. And, and daughter. They're yeah, both very They're grounded. beautiful kids. Well, that's... My, my wife, Jana, is like, you know, the greatest mother in the world. And I mean, she should open a hotel because she is yeah. literally the greatest hostess I've she's ever met. She's the greatest hostess, yeah. yeah. And the yeah. greatest wife and yeah, she's a great amazing. mother. Now, beautiful. This, this one here. This I funny. find this funny. We finally get to see how Italians would dress if they were English. Right. Now, that's what made me. you say that when you did this one? So, so you know you work with advertising agencies. So all of our career, we've always known that the Italians were really sort of jealous and they were seduced by British style. So all of the great Italian mills right. uh, covet British stuff. Now, British fabrics, English fabrics are scratchy and hard, and I love them. Yes. Italian fabrics, cashmere, they're smoother. But the Italians loved English style. So when you merged like... Italian creativity and British style. Right. That's what you got. Beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff. I and mean, the Italians are just, they're just so brilliant in I terms mean, of creativity. Let, let me just say, like, like what you're wearing right now, yeah. I have to comment on that because would you call, is that monochromatic? Yeah, I would say yeah. I, I, I kind of like dressing in tones because I think it's one message. Yeah, it's like, the, the, and I never wore... <laughs> A bandana. What do you call that? A bandana. You could call it a bandana. A bandana. Or a, yeah, yeah. And you made me, and I said, I never wore that, Joseph. And you said, well, and we tried on, and I tried it on, and you, well, I tried it, and you put it on me, and I put it under my shirt, and I You went, felt pretty good. I said, damn. I said, that, that looks really good. Yeah. Well, you know, I have my image of you, right? Right. So right. my image of you is sort of an artist, an actor, and an author. And I think sometimes it's okay to step out fashion-wise and dress who you are. I don't see you in a three-piece suit and a red tie and a what. Yeah. That's not you. And your clothes deliver your message. People, right. when they see you, you're sending them a message. Every time you right. go out, whatever, the president of the United States, whether you like them or not, whatever they put on, they're sending a message. Right. Uh, the, the prime minister, the king of England, they're sending a message with, you know, and everybody makes a conscious decision. You know, before I destroy the world, what right. suit am I wearing? You know, that right. people make every day, they make a fashion decision as to what they wear and how that represents themselves to other people. Like, the, 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 is that a vest? You yeah, it's, a, it's, um, it's an old shooting vest. Now, how, an old shooting vest. Now, I, now, I never dressed like that, but how would I look in that? See, here's the thing. I don't you're know. Tall, you're, if I, you know, let's say, and this is not even a makeover. Let's say we're doing a movie together, right? right? And I've got Chaz. Right. So I'm gonna look at the I'm gonna look at the script. I'm gonna look at I'm gonna say, what do you feel? What I love about it is you can wear anything because you you're tall, you you can wear anything. When we talked about the Woody Allen film with all your brown suits. Right. I that's my favorite story. Yeah. Because I don't see you in browns, browns yeah. and that well, and then muddy your colors, but I love the story you told. Well, the story, and to make it quick for yeah, the people sure. who don't know the story, I, I don't wear brown, and 
the uh, designer walks in, Jeffrey Kirtland, and says, all your clothes are... <laughs> yeah. He goes like this, and he shows me the whole thing. <laughs> I said, I can't wear brown. <laughs> and he goes, well, you better talk to Woody. And I spoke yeah. to Woody, and Woody said, yeah, yeah, I know, you don't look good. Yeah. And I said, but why are you doing that? He goes, because I want you to look like an extra, and as the film goes on, you take over That's the right. film. That's right. And I went, okay. But, isn't that, <laughs> but doesn't that show you how clothes really send a message? Yeah. They really send a message. They really so. send a message. Yeah. You're, you're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah, and I always... Uh, I always think I, I'm not doing it in judgment, but I can read. I I I get the person when I see them. Yeah, and I absolutely don't judge them. I just say I get it. I see, I that. could wear that in same kind of things in in like a gray, right? Like gray, silver. like gray, yeah. like gray or right. silver. And, so now and you just became a designer gray. because that's exactly right. You you have to. I don't ever believe you have a uniform that I. This uniform works for me, but maybe not. Yeah, you just. You know, you morph it, you you create it, you change it. That's the the creative part of um, menswear. But guys are a little bit timid when it comes to change. You know, guys. Guys are yeah. Guys are different. They get stuck in a time warp. If they wore yeah. a you know a suit through the '90s, you know, it's not the same thing today. Clothes are different. The clothes that we are working with with you. Yes. Notice they're leaner. Leaner. They they feel more important. Right. They're not as drapey or droopy no so they they have more character so, so now that i look at you i say okay so i could wear a gray tweed right you could wear a silver turtleneck a, that a, that's a silver turtleneck with a gray tweed and, yeah. and the, the, yeah. the suit and, right you wow. could and you could wear it with a darker oh. vest yeah could the, you have different shades of black no you can you can go you can go from dark gray mid gray black it's cool. When, it, when everything is all black, it's hard to see dimension. That's what I'm saying, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let's say you're wearing a tuxedo, like the one you wore Friday night. Yes. The character of the tuxedo is the fit. It's also the pocket square. It's the scarf. It's the way you tie your bow tie. It's the Frank Sinatra, that's the Frank Sinatra moment. Wow. So yeah. that's, those are the kinds of things I love. Wow. Yeah, it, it's just, you know, the more I talk to you about fashion, the more I learn, I yes. go... Well, I could duplicate that if I just uh, change the color. That's, but, you know, thank you for saying that because that's what I was trying to say to American men throughout my entire career. Yeah. You can take intelligent chances. You can take, you can step out and do something that still is in your comfort zone, but just pushes it a little bit. That's all. That's, I think, if I've had any success, it's because I've been able to kind of connect with men to say, yeah, you can look better. You can feel better. You can, you can do it. And it's not some, you know, crazy idea of men in skirts. It's just like, right. like, what's the right fit? What's the right style? A great accessory, a pocket square. Maybe a great watch. Maybe a, a bracelet. Just something that defines your personality. Right. The wrong watch could destroy an outfit. Isn't that something? I read once where they so said, interesting. Mm -hmm. nothing yeah. against Apple. But if you're wearing something, a great suit, and you have an Apple watch on, it can't doesn't believe you said go. That. I can't believe you said that. It it's just like doesn't... wearing a television set. I mean, basically, yes. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I still love, you know, Rolex is a wonderful brand. Yes, me too. I love, I love vintage watches. Yeah. I think the problem we have now is everybody uses their phone for time. Yeah. But watches are still a beautiful accessory for men. We don't have that many options as guys. What, you know, a what, beautiful yeah. watch is great. You know, yeah. the right, you know, like the right turtleneck under a jacket with maybe, yeah. you know, uh, a scarf or something that, I love because I saw Cary Grant. I told you with the silk scarf oh around God, yeah. when he had a tuxedo. I yeah. always wear scarves. Yeah, so yeah. I just constantly think of that. And well, think of the if you look at, uh, at if we talked about Casablanca. If you look at Humphrey Bogart in that white double-breasted dinner jacket. Yeah, there's nothing more masculine or handsome. Right. Than that. Most guys don't get that. They well, it's not for me. You can't be any more American style classic. Than right. That. And I and I do recommend, and I know you've done a lot with TCM Turner Classic Movies. You want to see great style? Watch a few old films. The way they tie their ties. Yeah. The best films for clothes ever were the Charlie Chan movies. Charlie Chan movies. I have to do, look at that. They're in the '30s. You have never seen double-breasted suits and and light-colored trousers and beautiful tailoring. I I I, I um I've always been amazed by how gorgeous those clothes wow. were. Yeah. And most people wouldn't even, you know. I'm going to I'm going to look at that Charlie yeah. Chan cuz I remember Charlie Chan. Yeah, they were I was it Warner Oland or I don't remember the exact actor, but yeah. they were films all through the 30s and yeah. 
and the way they dressed. <sighs> Gorgeous clothes. Well, I have to talk about because I have to because I was so stunned mm -hmm. when you took me up to your factory. Yeah. Now these everybody does all their work overseas now. Most which most is people. sad. Yeah. Yeah. You have a factory up in Boston. Yeah, in, in New Bedford. New just Bedford, outside of Boston. And yeah. it's been and how long have you had your factory? The Joseph Booth factory's been there since around 1986. 1986. Yeah. And you employ how many people? At its height, it was about 800 plus people. I mean, it's probably about somewhere be and it fluctuates based on the work. Could get 4 to 500 to 600 people, but Right. But it it's probably it's it is the largest uh, tailored clothing factory in North America. In North America. In North America, and that in, certainly includes Canada and Mexico. So, um, and as you met some of the people, the most down to earth. Oh my God! Incredible people, and that skill set is a hard thing to maintain. I think that factory, since we started the Joseph Abood collection, has made seven or eight million suits made in America. And that's the proudest thing. The suit, the all the garments that wow. you saw Friday night, seven or eight million suits, were all made in America. Now, now we should give a shout out to the, some of you people who run that. Who's like the number the, well, the, the number one guy there who makes the whole thing happen? Salvatore Malachi, yes. who was my how, how could I? He was my alter ego for. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, for 30 years. I know my favorite place in the world to design was at that factory. I could be in Paris, I could be in Milan, but when I was on that car driving up to New Bedford, I knew it was going to be a really creative thing. So the last fashion show that you were at, uh, 2019, right? we made over 200 garments all made by hand. And I was thinking as I was driving up, and I had all my notes, they're going to kill me. They're, what I want them to do, <laughs> I said, I, I was... And I, I'm not. I'm not being. I, I said they, they'll never do it. They can't do what I want them to do. Right. I literally had sketches. I sketched them in my kitchen here in Bedford. I took cut little pieces of swatches. I, I, I moved everything around. Literally had 200 sheets, and I'd done that over three or four uh, weeks designing these. Now I have to go up to the factory and get them made. And I'm saying this is the one time I've pushed them over the top. Right. They never said no. Salvatore, and it was, think of it, it's a lot of engineering. Okay, I, I have to make a lapel, but you want to make a lapel that's frayed at the edges. Uh, you want to make an American flag, but you don't want the flag to be straight. You want the flag, an American flag jacket with the flags, uh, the stripes going diagonally. And I wanted this, this the moment that uh, of the show, the 2019 show, was paying homage to Ellis Island and the people who came to America right. to make America great and to wow. be a part of growing and bringing their families up like my grandparents came through Ellis Island. Absolutely. Yeah. So <clears throat> I wanted the garments to be noble, but I wanted them to be worn. So I said, Sal, is there any way we could wash? Do we have a like washing machine somewhere in the factory? He said, no, but I'll wash them. He took the 200 garments home over the weeks that were made and he washed them in his washing machine at home, he and his wife. That's why he never said no. And I love this man. He was such a part of my history. And and and, and all of the people who've been there 25 and 30 years. Eva, yes. if you remember, she said, oh, I love the way that shoulder looks on you. Yes, Eva, Eva, Eva been there. right. All right. And to have you there, and, and I, I, right. I do want to say, they they don't get the credit they deserve they don't get celebrities like you walking through the factory. And I'm sorry if some of them wanted photos, no, but that doesn't you, you know, me. they, or in the restaurant, we no. go to a seafood restaurant. People that, think that, but that's, it's, it's, it's it, respectful. It, it was wonderful. No. Yeah. And, I, and, like and who was the young girl who took care of his Gina? Oh, oh, Jenny, Jenny. Oh, so that's Jenny. sweet. Well, and really, she's nice. got a very, very, very powerful position in the company. And I've known her since she was just a, an assistant. Yeah. Now she's running the custom area. And, they're all salt of the earth, and that's what America has But that's opened. you, Joseph. They've been with you 30 years, yeah, over yeah, 30 yeah, years, yeah. because, you know, there's an Italian saying, you know, the fish stinks from the head down. Yeah, I know. You know, and you are, seriously, you're, you're a beautiful man. I, yeah. I mean that sincerely. Okay. Your, your talent, the way you design, 
and I got to tell you, f- folks, seriously, am I a little biased? Probably, but okay. you check out his collections. You know, if if you want to look, so if you want every woman and every man to look at you, uh, Joseph of Boots clothes. Joseph, Thank it's you. been a real pleasure having you. Know, Chaz, you. Um, this is like this is a. a wait a minute! Love. Wait a minute! Before I leave, I have to say, you rabid Boston Red Sox fan, <laughs> how are you think you're going to do this year? Ah, uh, well, I think I showed you this picture of me oh, throwing out the first oh, picture right. at Fenway, right? Joseph Abood throwing out the first picture at Fenway Park. So, do I have time to tell you that story? Yes, yes. So, go ahead. So. I've been, as as you know, you grow up, you never lose your allegiance. If you lived in, I don't know, out of Mongolia, right. you're going to be a Yankee fan. Yeah. I live in New York behind enemy lines, but I'll always be a Red Sox always. fan because my dad was a Red Sox fan. Yeah, that's Like it. your dad. It's in your blood. Right. So um, my dad and my, when my, my dad was very disabled when he, he was, uh, when I was a little boy. We could never go to Fenway. We we he, we didn't have the money, and he he couldn't go. He right. was disabled. But we used to listen to the Red Sox games on my porch outside on the evening, and he'd have my, his arm around me. Wow. And one of my biggest regrets was we never went to Fenway together. You know, we didn't. But he loved the Red Sox. So around 2000, 2004, 2005, I had done a lot of work with Nomar Garcia Parra, who was sort of the Boston star. Right. Um, with the Jeters and the A-Rods, you know, that that whole group of great players. And he said, you've done so much work. How would you like to throw out the first pitch at Fenway? I said, oh, my God. You know, so for two weeks before, I was in my driveway in Bedford nailing the trash cans 60 feet, 6 inches, throwing, <laughs> throw, throwing the pitches. So the day comes, and I say, there's a place I can warm up. They go, no, you can't warm up. So now they give me the ball. It's time for me to throw out the first pitch. And I get out there and I look at 38,000 people. And I go, I, you know, all of a sudden, usually the backup catcher will come out and catch the Right, pitch. right. But who comes out of the dugout but Nomar Garcia? Pablo. Nomar. Nomar. And the place <laughs> goes berserk. They're not going berserk for me. Right, I understand. And yeah. Stephen King, two weeks before, you know, yeah. big Boston Red Sox fan, he throws out the first pitch and he bounces it two-thirds oh, of the way up. Forget Food it. like crazy. I was at the game. I said, what are they going to do to a designer on the mound if I bounce so I said, I hadn't waited this long. I'm going to pit, I'm going to throw it from the mound. Right. So I go up and before he, um, I throw the pitch, Nomar comes up to me and he said, let's just play catch. And he took my nerves down a notch. Yeah. And I threw, um, it was a little high and outside, but I got huge raves, but the raves were no more. You know, they were. No, but, but you he didn't did bounce that. it. No, I didn't bounce it at all. It was a good pitch and he was great. But let me tell you the most important part of that. I asked, they said, what do you want to say on the Jumbotron? And I said, I'd like it to say in honor, I have to be a little careful, but yeah. in honor of Joseph Abood's dad, Joseph Abood, a lifelong oh. Red Sox fan. And that's just, I said to, I looked up and I said, you know, dad, we finally made it to Fenway together. So, well, yeah. and what a way to make it to Fenway. Yeah. Yeah. So, together. Yeah. So, so that well, he, was a memory. He said, well, look, you put it on. That's yeah, yeah. So I turn around, the, I see my dad's name, you know, on the on the on the jumbotron. Well, I mean, that's a beautiful way to end this yeah. uh, episode, Joseph. It's been an honor to have you on. It really has. Well, I Chaz, mean, it's my honor. Thanks. No, I, I am so proud that I was able to give you the Medal of Honor. Thank you. Uh, the first time a menswear designer. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty special. It means a lot on a very personal level. It. And especially having you be there. And- yes. No, I, it was my honor to give it to you. And uh, folks out there, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, Joseph Abood, his clothes are, you want to look sharp, you want every man and woman to envy you when you walk into a room. <laughs> this is the guy. He is uh, not only a great artist, a good soul, but, you know, when it comes down to it, folks, you got to be a good man. And he's like, He's, he's the top of the list. He's a good man. Joseph, it's, it's been you, my Chaz. pleasure. It was such a joy. Thanks. God bless you. Thanks, Jess.